My name is Colleen Estrada. I'm the design director for Microsoft Research Fuse Labs, the event sponsor for the annual design expo. On stage with me is our trusty MC, Melissa Quintanilla. She's the design director and founder of Dupla Studios, a Seattle-based ad agency, and formerly of my studio in Microsoft Research. Um, last year, she competently handled our MCing, and I asked her to do that again for us today. Um, thank you, Melissa. So um, I'm just going to talk really briefly about the goals of Design Expo. It began really 13 years ago, I think now. Lily Chang and several other design leaders in industry and academia joined together and said, wouldn't it be marvelous if we gathered the top design uh, schools from around the world and posed a challenge to them to build community, foster collaboration, and just learn from each other. And that has gone on, that tradition has gone on now for the past 13 years. Really quickly about this year's challenge, the challenges are always varied and try to be super um, current. Um, for this year's challenge, we look to our past, our present, and our hopefully designed perfect future, which we know is very hard to achieve, impossible in fact, and, and posed a challenge of achieving symbiosis, taking a nod from JCR Licklider's pivotal work on man-computer symbiosis, which imagined a world where humans and computers were interacting real time seamlessly to achieve things. We looked to our present and determined that, wow, this is the last year, a plethora of chatty bots were emerging and personal agent services that were doing all manner of things for us, often being driven, the commanding interface being the CUI, the conversational user interface, or the CUI combined with the GUI. Why is this a great thing? Well, for that symbiotic motion, that, that symbiotic symbiosis of the human and computer um, being able to work better together. Now, we think that with the CUI, the GUI, and uh, you know, all the, the pervasive user agents, there will be new types of computing experiences that we can de design, and that's where we pose the challenge. So that's the brief background on the challenge. You will see the nine student presentations from everything from the, the, the practical and plausible to the perfectly provocative coming up. So it's a great show. Melissa is going to handle the rest of the process and management of the program for you. Thank you, Colleen. So a bit about the process of Design Expo. Design Expo culminates today in this event, but it's a process that lasts almost a whole year. So it starts in the fall of the year before, where the schools and professors and, and the topic or challenge are selected. Then each school has a course on the subject, and we also assign Microsoft liaisons to partner with those schools throughout the course to give feedback on the student projects and also to select the winning project to come here present. Some of these classes are up to 20 some people. They have sometimes eight groups. So today you're seeing the top selected groups of each of those schools. The schools today are gonna to present their work at Design Expo. They have eight minutes to present and then they have brief feedback on the critics. And the critics today are, we have Lisa Strassfeld. Lisa is an information architect and data visualization entrepreneur. She's currently principal of her own studio, Information Art. Since last year, she's been acting global creative director of the Gallup organization. And prior to Gallup, she spent three years at Bloomberg where she built and led their first data visualization team. Prior to Bloomberg, Lisa was partner at Pentagram, one of the top design consultancies in the world, for almost 10 years. She left Pentagram to launch Major League Politics, a startup that measures and visualizes government activity with the goal of entertainment. She has received the 2010 National Design Award for Interaction Design. She holds four patents related to user interfaces. She's been a senior scientist at the Gallup organization for the past 10 years. And she has taught uh, interaction design at the Yale School of Art and NYU's ITP program, which is one of the schools participating today. Help me welcome Lisa to our panel of judges. <clears throat> Next up, we have Cliff Kwong, first time critic at Design Expo. Welcome, Cliff. Cliff is the director of product innovation at Fast Company and is currently leading a redesign of Fast Company's digital presence. Cliff is also the founding editor of Co.Design, Fast Company's design site, which is probably on the reading list of all designers I know. 
In, in 20, 2011, Coda Design won the National Magazine Award for Best Online Department. Previously, Cliff has been an editor at ID Magazine and The Economist Online. His work has appeared regularly in Wired, Popular Science, and Good. Speaking of writing, Cliff is currently working on a book about user experience, so stay tuned. Thank you, Cliff, for being here. Next up, we have Bill Buxton. Bill is a relentless advocate for innovation and design, especially when it comes to our human values, capacity, and culture in relationship to new products and technology, which is very pertinent to the themes of Design Expo every year. This is reflected in all of his work, from research to teaching to talks and writing, including his column on design and innovation for businessweek.com and his 2007 classic book, Sketching User Experiences, which I personally own a copy and every designer I know owns a copy. And I see some nodding in the audience. We just call it the yellow book. Over 10 years, he was appoint over 10 years ago, he was appointed principal uh, researcher at Microsoft Research. And prior to that, he was principal of his own Toronto-based design and consulting firm, Buxton Design. Bill beca began his career as a musician, a composer and performer. In 1975, he started de designing his own electronic instruments, and that was a path that led him to human-computer interaction. He has won many awards, too many to list here, and he has been awarded four doctorates honoris causa. Thank you so much, Bill, for being here. <clears throat> Our fourth critic today is Rob Gerling. Rob is the co-founder of Artifact, a technology product design company based in Seattle. Artifact was founded in 2006, so it's been offering amazing designs and inspiration to all of us for the past 10 years. Thank you, Rob. His career started at Apple after winning the 1991 and 1992 Apple Student Interface Design Competition for concepts around mobile and personal computing. Rob then spent 10 years right here at Microsoft obtaining several patents and making significant contributions to Microsoft Office, Microsoft Games, and, and later becoming design manager for UI, brand, and UX for Windows XP. Rob left Microsoft in 2002 and has worked as a senior interaction designer for IDEO, another, <clears throat> another top design consultancy in the world. And prior to co-founding Artifact, Rob worked for Sony Computer Entertainment of America as a lead game designer. Thank you, Rob, for being here again. <clears throat> Last but not least, a special thanks to Mike Caspro. Mike is a behind-the-scenes critic for Design Expo. He has been helping run Design Expo for the last nine years. He comes the two days before the conference and provides valuable feedback to all of the student projects. The students go through two rounds of rehearsals and Help Mike helps polish their presentation before they present to all of you. He is a senior vice president and executive creative director of innovation and digital with the advertising agency BBDO. He is more a family man than a madman. He lives in Toronto and apologizes for Justin Bieber, but not Drake. <laughs> Thanks, Mike, for being here. Here's the list of schools for this year. Please hold your applause until I read all of the names. We have Savannah College of Art and Design, University of Washington, Umeå University from Sweden, University of California, Los Angeles, Carnegie Mellon University, Art Center College of Design, University of Dundee, New York University, and University of Southern California. Round of applause to the schools. We are ready to dive right in. The first school today is Savannah College of Art and Design with Co, the Story Building Companion. Hey everybody, uh, my name is Scott and this is Andrew, Ashley and Maya and we are from SCAD, uh, it's Savannah College of Art and Design and thank you very much for inviting us to the ex Expo. We've had an amazing week and uh, really am excited about showing you guys how SCAD does CUI. 
Uh, so let's start off with our process. Uh, we began in early April uh, with some initial research that gave us these kind of eight areas uh, and topics that centered around CUIs, and we boiled that down to our four pillars. And these four kind of foundational pillars gave us direction on our uh, initial ideation. And we came up with these two concepts of memory and friendship, and then we pushed and pulled on those two concepts and boiled it down to something we'll talk about with you today, uh, companion. Uh, and then while doing this research, we're, of course, we're looking for our area of opportunity. We're looking for our problem to solve and things like uh, family interaction and a conversation that happens between a parent and a child, that kind of started rising up to the top. Uh, but not just family interactions. The uh, barriers in family interactions like uh, scheduling, work, school, and, of course, our lovely digital devices. Uh, families would come home plop down on the couch, and bury their head in the digital sand. But nobody freak out. Everything's fine. We actually believe that technology can bring a family together. Uh, we, do know, uh, we do know that uh, parents and children are our target audience now. And we hit the street. We went out, interviewed them, talked to them, and we found some really great nuggets of information that helped us. We found out that stories storytelling uh, is one of the most powerful mediums of conversation that can happen between a parent and a child. But more than storytelling, the idea of story building, uh, that stories that are built together between a parent and a child uh, have much more meaning. Uh, also, we learned about a companion, that a child can take a toy, they can take a prop, uh, and they can give it a voice, personality, uh, and they can give it life. And so our insights are directing us toward this idea of a story-building companion. I mean, there it is in front of us, right? I mean, can we all say it together now? Story-building companion. Thank you very much. And so we took our story-building companion, and we named it Co. And this little guy here uh, has a personality that's very friendly, very helpful, very approachable. And he is our story building companion uh, for families. And he uses a conversation to facilitate the creation and the archiving and the retelling of family narratives. Thank you, Scott. Hi, everybody. My name is Andrew. And I grew up in New York in the 90s. Um, I remember as a child, I was afraid of fire trucks and policemen and people outside my bedroom window. And my mother, she would tell me stories of wildlife and tigers outside her bedroom window when she was growing up in South Korea. Her mother, my grandmother, would tell her stories to calm her down of walking amongst tanks and soldiers during the Korean War. Um, and I realized that there's an incredible gap Everybody knows an excellent storyteller, but not everybody is good at telling stories. I personally have been screwing them up my entire life. <laughs> um, but conversation in the form of a story building platform can bring families together and they can build and hold on to those narratives that are irreplaceable. Co does this through a projector. This projector it brings your story to life on the fly. Co also has an IR emitter and an IR depth sensor to give it a sense of where it is. It has a camera so that you could take your selfies. It'll recognize your gestures, your face. It has an LED at the bottom that changes color. This increases intensity. It blinks uh, so that Co has a personality and it gives mood to the stories that it tells. It also has a wireless charging pad at its base. On the back, Co has another camera with the same functionality as the one on the front. It has a microphone array so that it can pick up where you are and have the conversation with you. It has Wi-Fi so we can stay updated. And it has a hi-fi speaker to give more life to the stories. So how does Co learn? Well, it does this through four components. Co understands language through natural language processing after it's been trained on very large data sets. Uh, these data sets include children talking to children and chil children talking to adults. Uh, three examples are Kids Corpus, T-Ball, and Childs. It also has a curated database. This is the content inside of Co. 
this curated database is made by a curation team that makes sure that everything that Co says is family friendly and appropriate. What about concepts and words that Co doesn't know? That's when the named entity recognizer comes into play. This named entity recognizer separates recognizable words like Seattle from generic unknown words and it applies it to the metadata algorithm. This metadata algorithm this metadata algorithm uh, applies new definitions to unknown concepts and unknown words based on contextual relationships. This is how Co learns. Thank you, Andrew. Hello, my name is Ashley, and the core of our, the heart of our design is retelling, building, and archiving. Um, we wanted, we built Co because we wanted to bring the family together, but those barriers that we mentioned before, like uh, store, um, school and work, sometimes are undeniable and we can't get away from them. We wanted to build a separate platform to allow parents to uh, get connected to those memories and those stories that they build with Co when they're not in the same room. So maybe they're in another room cooking dinner or they're here at a wonderful business trip here at Microsoft. Um, we call this platform Rico, which is a content management system that's cloud-based and is specifically designed to be paired with Co. Um, this RICO application allows parents to be updated on their children's interests and their ventures while they're away, but also acts as a sort of administration and archiving tool that uh, gives parents the ability to fully uh, take advantage of Co's capabilities. So with archiving, parents are able to access a weekly update or a calendar-like interface where they can uh, access these stories that has the images and these stories as text that are recorded during their adventure. And they can either download this to their phone or they can print it out as an artifact. Rico also has the ability to generate infographics that uh, give parents a sort of analysis of Co's interactions with the children. And that includes how much time Co has spent with the family, how much time Co has spent with a child alone, and then how many words has Co learned throughout its interactions, as well as how, how many times they've used that word. And finally, Co is, uh, or excuse me, Rico allows parents to establish restrictions. Um, so, for instance, they can uh, talk to and chat with Rico through a conversation interface that uh, kind of acts and was inspired by Microsoft's very own chatbot, Shawice. Thank you, Ashley. Hello, everyone. My name is Maya, and I had the pleasure of working with Ginny Claggett and her children to validate Co. So during our initial meeting, we were there to observe the family partaking in storytelling and story building activities. What we saw is that the children's level of engagement really increased during story building. So after a few weeks and a few foam iterations, we revisited the family with our final prototype. And what we wanted to learn is whether at its bare minimum, Co has the ability to suspend the user's disbelief that this is a story building companion. It's not just a plastic shell with a bunch of electronics inside. So using voice functionality only, Co and the family built a story about a polar bear who wanted to visit his friend the wombat in Australia. And to the children, this was enough. In their words, Co was like magic. We also introduced Rico to Ginny, and as a mother of four, and I'm sure the parents in here can relate, she expressed that, you know, sometimes you're just too exhausted to remember the stories that you tell your children. And to her, Rico's greatest benefit is the ability to archive these stories. It's really one of the things that makes Co and Rico special. You know, it's to create, archive, and retell stories, not just with parents and children, but with grandparents. And in turn, this creates a really valuable family artifact. Story building is a collaborative experience, one that brings families together. Co is our story building companion for families to create, <coughs> archive, and retell magical stories. And no parent, child, grandparent, or anyone in here should be without a little magic. Thank you guys so much for this opportunity, and we hope you enjoyed meeting Co. Thank you, Savannah. Now let's go on to the judges' comments. Rob, would you like to start? Um, thanks very much, guys. You, you did a really good job with the presentation. You guys must have rehearsed this 100,000 times. Um, <laughs> very slick. Um, nice job. I, I, um, 
I'm curious about the you know the formation of this industrial design piece in terms of what went into the thinking around its shape and form and what's inside it and all of that. But uh, you know we don't really have time to get into all of that. But I you know it's kind of an interesting provocative device. It's sort of friendly and benevolent and it's a projector and a recorder. I guess the only question in my mind um, is, is so sort of what is the experience of reliving a story? You know, I don't, and I don't know whether that was something that was omitted for time or um, that you created as an example of the kind of um, thing that would be captured conversationally and then, and then, you know, what would the output look like? How did you, what was the output of a co-created story with Co? Um, that would, I think, have been emotionally the kind of the cell um, in terms of, you know, that's the output, that's the value that it brings to a family uh, to relive memories. Mm. So, um, so again, congratulations. It was really well done. Thank you. Um, Thank, you. Thank, Thank you. you. You told the story well, but you didn't have the story tell. I'm curious, could you give a snapshot? Like, I, 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 have it, I'm having, I want to understand a bit more about what the role the projector plays in and how the visuals come and, and, Absolutely. Uh, and stuff. Absolutely. Um, I can do the yeah. first okay. one. Right. So, so a girl named Samantha, she walks into a house, and she, or her, her house, and she hears a new voice coming from the kitchen. And in the kitchen, she hears the voice of Ko that her parents have bought her. She walks up to it, and this is the first time they've interacted. And the very first story that Ko builds is a personalized backstory. It's the hero's origin story, and it's what makes Ko uh, unique to every family. In this situation, she would, Ko would ask Samantha, uh, what do you think I look like? She would say, maybe an egg. And based on that key word, the projector would come to life. Ko would ask Samantha to step aside pointed in a right direction, and the picture of a nest, perhaps, would come up to the wall. And then based on that, they go on this journey, almost like a Mad Libs exchange, where new images are applied to the environment based on their conversation. And, and, and what state is it in at this point? Like, I don't expect to be a product, but I'm just curious, um, how the, what was the level of refinement you got? Excuse me? Yeah. What is the level yeah. you got in terms of implementation that you could actually test the ideas? Oh, uh, this was engagement? fully functional at one point. Um, we ran all the hardware, all the pieces. <laughs> yeah. It's a prototype. Right. Yeah. We got all the pieces working. And uh, we ran this through uh, a Raspberry Pi using processing and Python. Um, unfortunately, wires are very difficult to get on a plane, we realized. <laughs> <laughs> None of us have ever had that problem. <laughs> so that's great. Thank, thanks a million. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Again, agree. Amazing presentation, and you—the beginning of the presentation really, sort of, you know, got me emotionally um, as a parent. And I think I, I agree that I, I wanted the story. I wanted the the experience, and actually. Mm -hmm. And if there were more time, you know, and I would have been m more interested and open in, to the the detail around the UI and the mm -hmm. features. Mm -hmm. So that I, I agree was the one piece that mm -hmm. could have hooked me. It was the the pitch, mm -hmm. but beautifully done. We have some time. If you have comments, I, I mean, I would agree with that too. I mean, I, I'm sort of curious a bit. Like, there, there is like, there was this layer that you guys thought about in terms of like the emotional quality of the story and the sort of idea that light would play a role in helping lend a kind of emotional kind of a commentary over images. I'm wondering like how you actually imagined that experience happening. Yeah, I think uh, the LED light could be something almost like a welcoming, kind of a warming light when someone enters the room that our IR sensors can tell, yes, someone's coming in the room, and the LED light just slowly glows. And also perhaps during a, a story, if there's really an exciting time, perhaps the color changes and blinks and gives the story more personality. So it's kind of a, a visual aid uh, that can happen during a story. And also, again, as a greeting, perhaps. Yeah, I thought that was a, a really like a potentially like a fruitful sort of thing like to cr to develop as a kind of um, 
you know, every, every object, it, if it's going to have some emotional import, has to have that one detail mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. feels like it actually, the, the personality of that thing lives there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, and it seemed like that could actually be the, the outlet for that. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, totally. Absolutely. Thank you very much for the thoughtful comments. Thank you, Savannah. Yeah, thanks. Great you. job. Next up, we have the home team, University of Washington, with Polly. I'm Angelica. And I'm Chloe. And we are millennials. There are a lot of us. The, millenn the millennial population currently exceeds that of the baby boomers by millions. And because of this, it would seem right that the millennials make up the majority of the American voting population. However, when you look at the 2012 presidential election, you see that we're not really showing up to vote. A lot of different age groups vote more than us. And when we look at even smaller elections, such as midterm elections, our turnout is even worse. And it's elections like these that are really problematic that we don't show up because these elections are where change begins. Change begins when you vote consistently and constantly. So for young voters, it's important for us to not only show up during presidential elections, but also to show up during midterm elections, during state elections, and most importantly, during local elections. Um, Change starts small, and time and time and again, we've seen this hold true in policy changes having to do with gay marriage, with climate change, and with minimum wage. Democracy is measured by the strength and voice of its citizens, and this voice must be heard more than once. Young people have to vote again and again and again. So with that, meet Polly. What if there was an easy way to participate in politics? A space to ask questions, become informed, a reliable companion that you can ask anything. How many debates are left before the election? Who are my state district representatives? And trust that it would have answers, big or small. According to USA Today, Sanders is a top pick in the upcoming caucus. So what is a caucus? Great question, Joey. It would help you get involved in politics that matter to you. Don't forget, there's a town hall meeting this Thursday to discuss the new housing policy. So, how would that bill affect where we live? And think about how those issues affect other people, too. Jake will still pay the taxes for the light rail, even though he lives five miles from the closest station. Talking about politics with your friends has never been easier. Democracy is a conversation. If you can change the conversation, you can change everything. Be a part of it. Now, Polly is a personalized political companion. She's a conversational user interface that empowers millennials to be informed and engaged in politics. Polly, is, Polly was not a product, um, rather a physical product. Um, we created her with, she is a thoughtful concept and as well a necessary concept that we believe will change how millennials participate in democracy. In the past, command line interfaces and graphical user interfaces have required people to tell the computer what they want. Now with conversational user interfaces, the computer already knows what people want. And this is something really special because a good conversational user interface has all of the benefits of back-end computing, but also can act like a human. This makes them adaptable and invisible, and also a perfect candidate for a role as a political companion. So was, when we looked into designing Polly, we had three main goals. We wanted to begin with understanding each user. And to fully understand a person, Polly works to foster a long-term relationship. The earpiece that you saw in the video is just one of the many devices that Polly is manifested in. Um, she's designed to be a platform agnostic system so she can be everywhere. This enables her to collect information about your commute on the way home, what you do in your free time, or your existing political views. Additionally, Polly removes the legwork from getting involved in the political system. She's constantly working. Polly provides relevant information to you and tracks, in, tracks events and news that you are interested in. And finally, Polly really works to empower change. Many millennials, millennials feel there's a gap between 
your personal opinion and your, what you want and what actually happens, making change. A lot of millennials also think that in order to close this gap, it involves like arguing with your crazy uncle about Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. We all have that uncle. <laughs> but it turns out this is not the solution. Polly enables users to help find how they can actively be participants in politics. She helps them find local level, small participant actions like canvassing or phone banks to get involved. When designing Polly, we also wanted to look into what she was not and make sure we were aware of her limitations. Polly is not a personal assistant. She is designed specifically to be a political companion and she finds her limits within politics. Additionally, Polly is not opinionated. On a behavioral level, she's never going to tell you what to do. She's not going to tell you how to think. She's going to help you develop your own political opinion, might, maybe challenging it at times, but ultimately always referring, deferring back to you. In order to make people feel comfortable discussing politics with a computer, you need to have a level of trust. Many existing U CUIs fit into these axes. Uh, these, these axes show a lot of qualities that many existing CUIs fall underneath. We can see through this range, many range from robot-like and serious down to playful and human-like. Polly, however, exists in a unique space. Her serious tone mimics that of the political sphere, while her human-like conversational skills make her approachable and warm. Together, these qualities help foster a huge element of Polly's success, which is trust. It's hard to challenge someone's opinion if they don't trust you. Polly is designed to gain this trust through three stages of a very complex relationship. In phase one, Polly is learning about you while you are learning about her. She shows you more top level bits of information, engages your response to learn more about your knowledge and your opinion. This is where she works to build the foundation of not only your political opinion, but your relationship with her as well. Once Polly gets a sense for what matters to you, she becomes more of a guide. She will start sharing relevant information to your lifestyle, like zoning changes in your neighborhood. You're you're still having conversations with Polly, but Polly has also prepped you to begin having informed political decisions outside of the system. Go to your town hall meeting and speak up. Polly makes the biggest impact on stage three. By now, you and Polly have worked together to develop your fact-based political opinion. Your trust in Polly allows her to ask you some harder questions that might challenge the opinion that you know. Ultimately, you have learned to think critically, question your own opinion, and inform your own vote. Paul uses a specific content aggregation system to decide what she shares with you during these times. During the educational phase of our relationship, Polly works to ensure that all the information you're receiving is, is fact and data-based. This comes from nonpartisan sources such as C-SPAN, White Papers, and Pew Research Center. This guarantees that you can first focus strictly on developing a fact-based political opinion. Once you have worked with Polly to develop the basis of your political voice, she expands her reach to include information from data-driven think tanks. By doing so, she is inevitably introducing a higher risk of bias. However, what makes Polly successful here is the transparency around sources. By informing you about where this information is coming from, she's making you wary of what biases you might encounter, teaching you how to, how to deal with them, and introducing you to more contrasting opinions. In the most advanced phase of your relationship with Polly, you're receiving news, updates, and information from all political sources, all political sources, partisan ones included. By now, with Polly's guidance, you know that Fox News and MSNBC should not be perceived as fact, but you also know that digesting them is an important part of understanding all sides of a political issue. They help you develop your opinions and your stance on politics. You are, by this point, you are qualified to identify biases and be a highly aware media consumer. You can also probably even now have a polite, informed political discussion with your crazy uncle about Donald Trump. <laughs> In a world with Polly, millennials see the potential they have to make change. This is by voting again and again and again. And we think the future of democracy is Polly. Thank you. Thank you, you dub. Let's go on to the judges' comments, Cliff. Sorry, I jumped the gun a little bit. He was bit. so excited. <laughs> um, 
So thank you guys for your presentation. It was really well done. Um, actually, the the sort of polish and the in the in the clarity of the information presentation in your presentation actually reminded me a little bit of Lisa, actually in her work. Um, so uh, one thing that I think thought really got me right in the presentation is the declaration of the problem, right? Um, a lot of times the student work, that's one of the most difficult things to actually articulate is what problem you're trying to solve. And when you put it like, um, you know, there's this problem of continuous engagement, actually, th that you had me, had me right there. Um, the thing that I wondered about, though, is like, why would, what sort of, what is the incentive for somebody to keep coming back to this product? to use it over and over again, because some of what you describe already assumes somebody that's very much engaged in these, in, in these issues, right? There's perhaps, a, you're presenting a more frictionless way to engage with these issues, but at the same time, you're, that also assumes that somebody's already engaged. And so I wonder if you guys thought about what brings a new person to this product that wouldn't other, otherwise be engaged in these issues. Um, yeah, we definitely think that sort of the millennial target fits best into working with like exciting new technology. You know, there's some sort of Pokemon Go component that it's new and it's there if you want to interact with it. Um, and I think that sort of the long term maintaining that relationship is sort of one of the, when we talk about the perks of the long term relationship and embedding Polly into it, is her just understanding you better. And I know that's sort of a hope and a wishful dream that a CUI fully understands you, but um, it's sort of those details of the long-term relationship that you know she picks up on. You don't really want to talk on your commute ride home, but when you're making breakfast in the morning, you are wanting to be engaged. And hopefully by this time, she's giving you enough information that you feel like your voice is being heard and you want to continue interacting with her and interacting with, engaging with the politics. I, I, I love this project and, of course, I um, have a particular interest in it. Mm -hmm. And I agree with Cliff, just, um, just the framing of the problem uh, was really, you know, a huge, um, a huge part of what, what I think is so successful about this. Um, and I think that the, the um, I mean, the, what I saw of the technology was something in people's ears, is that, um, I mean, one way that she was realized, one yeah. Way. I mean, what's, what's, what's cool about this project is that you could, I mean, this technology, um, this, this information is available to millennials now. I like that it has uh, a place in space. It has a, um, it, it's, um, it's sort of defined as a thing that's, um, that is working constantly to engage you, which is, which is such a huge part of the problem. I mean, and, and for the example of the caucus, like, to explain a caucus, I mean, it's, 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 it's um, its own sort of challenge. The examples were really well done. Um, I also love the way you, you described the um, the spectrum of liberal to conservative and the sources. So again, just just the idea of making a place for this thing, sticking it in your ear or wherever it, you know, um, and and encouraging millennials to um, to think about this, you know, before the election sort of springs up on us. I think is is. Um, a great contribution. Thank you. Thank you. So I think there's this deep challenge, right, it's about developing critical thinking. And especially in some sense, if you look around right now, I worry about so-called information technologies. Uh, you might question how informed we are, whether we're better or worse informed. And the question is, I really like the notion, uh, you could just get a job in copywriting, by the way. Um, forget design. In terms of this, democracy is a conversation. If you change the conversation, you can change everything. Uh, that's that, that's a very that, that's a very mature way to articulate things. And and so the notion that it's not about the technology, but it's about the nature of the conversation and how you interact with it. And that's a feature of design. And how you design it can change the biases, which can provoke that the types of conversations, and they reflect a certain value. And so the, what I find interesting throughout your work is the underlying values that are reflected by it, that you never really called out, but they're obvious based in how you chose it. And, and, uh, and I think that's the part that we don't tend to talk about or even try to teach. And, and so I really appreciated it in your, uh, how you presented it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm so with you on this project. It's, it's awesome. Um, love where you're coming from. I think there's two things I wanted to say. One was, um, it's amazing when you talk about conversational UI and the future of UI and 
where we're going, how formless your presentation is in terms of there is no there is no thing we're talking about. You're describing it very very beautifully and very articulately, but there is no artifact, right? There's nothing nothing there, and that's actually one of these sort of super, it may take the form of something in your ear, it may not. Um, it may be many in many different places and many different experiences, and I think that's that's also commendable in terms of your uh, the advancedness of your thinking. The second thing I wanted to point out was I'm with you on you know the benefit to society here is clear and the benefit to the individual is clear. Is there a business, mm. or is this a government thing? Um, We've talked about it. I mean, in some ways, it's like the ultimate campaign manager, right? That it like gets people talking about your stuff in the way that you know in Obama's election or Clinton's election. That language is way, way more accessible. And so sort of like bringing it, that language to people in a much more streamlined way. Um, it's not something we've thought deeply about, but it's definitely been on our radar a little bit. Great job, guys. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, you Doug. Next up, we have Umea Institute of Design from Sweden with Nume Personalized Nutrition. On that note, uh, hello, my name is uh, Lena, and together with me to here today is Janre, Joanna, and Andre, and we're representing Umeå Institute of Design from Sweden. Today we're going to talk about something that's very important to all of us, and that's food. One of the biggest challenges in today's society is helping people understanding the connection between lifestyle-related diseases and what they eat, or rather, what they don't eat. Because when such a significant number of people can say that they think it's easier to figure out how to do their taxes than figuring out how to eat healthily, we have a problem. So one fact is that those information printed on the food packages is quite cryptic for most of customers. And people don't understand it and what it means to their bodies. So getting feedback from how food we eat affects us is quite lagging. And especially in contrast to other aspects in our life, such as uh, if we touch something hot, we will instantly jump back in pain. And also quantified self is a big trend today. But our data provided by tracking devices, it's really hard for us to understand and also left this user feeling lost. So the challenge becomes that how should we bridge the gap between daily meals and its long-term effects to our bodies? So how can we address those issues? During this project, we became very passionate about translating nutrition into actions. Because if we see information about grams, milligrams, calories, we don't really know what does it mean to our body. But if we tell you, that you are a little bit low on potassium and that might be the reason you are feeling tired and you can easily fix it with bananas, you are much more motivated to take actions. One of the core goals that we had in this project was to try to combine the knowledge and the competence of the pharmaceutical companies together with a nutrition specialist and place it in the hands of the end user and in their very own home. In this way, the end user can have more control and uh, create a consciousness about their own nutrition. One of our end users were pregnant women. We found during our research that a lot of women find themselves in an overload of information both prior, during and after pregnancy in a lot of dietary restrictions. They were often told what not to eat rather than what to eat. We also spoke to nutrition specialists about how people develop habits in, the, in the, what they eat. And we found that people decide what to eat based on their taste, their preference in food. So we asked ourselves, how can we create a system where we maintain or allow people to eat the things that they like, but at the same time keep it nutritious and healthy? 
With this in mind, we created NUMI, and I invite you to watch our concept video. Food. We all love it. And we all need it. But understanding what to eat in order to get the nutrients that you need can be hard. And sometimes in life, you might find yourself in a situation where what you eat makes the greatest difference. What if there could be someone who could help you with this task? Someone who could always be there to keep an eye on you. Someone who lets you know what your body needs. This is why we created Numi. Your companion in creating your very own personalized nutrition. Numi learns what you like to eat and what you don't. She gives you tips on what you eat based on your own preference. Yumi, I don't feel like rice for dinner after all. That's fine. What about tortilla with roasted vegetables? Ah, oh, that's perfect. Okay, you start with cutting up two tomatoes, half a cucumber, and some salad. Sometimes, a very diet is not enough to give you all the nutrients you need. Don't worry, Yumi's got you covered. She will create nutri drops to supplement your diet. Numi can offer you support wherever you are. Hi Numi, I'm going away for three days. Could you please print me the nutri drops I need? No problem, Frida. Through touching the nutri patch, she can let you know how well your body is doing. Numi and you are a team, and together you explore what food and nutrition means to you. What makes Numi unique? Numi takes care of you from the very beginning. Johan and Frida, you met during the video, went to a website and answered a couple of simple questions. And that helped them assess which kind of set uh, that Numi can provide will fit their lifestyle. Numi was shipped to their doorstep along with instructions. Nutri is a flexible system that adjusts to the user. In Johan's case, it consists from NutriPatch, which analyzes his blood values, and NutriApp, which he might go to to get uh, in-depth information. Frida needs uh, some more support, so uh, besides NutriPatch and NutriApp, she is also using NutriMaker, which 3D prints her NutriDrops. NutriDrops provide some extra supplements for people who need support at the time. In Frida's case, uh, it's because of her pregnancy. NutriPatch is a layer of second skin which provides uh, users with overview how they are doing. Um, we provide feedback, uh, tactile feedback, uh, which is based on the metaphor of human skin. If we are not eating healthfully, it might become rough or we can get a rush. So where does CUI and AI come into this? If we look at the current systems and applications on the market today, they require high levels of user participation. They're always nagging us, asking us to input data, and it's quite intrusive. However, with CUI and AI, we're now presented with the opportunity for these systems to learn and take advantage of, of who we are and adapt their functions accordingly. With Numi, we became very interested in making, uh, using CUI and AI to make the system non-intrusive, so that she goes into the background of our daily lives and adapts according to the user's needs. But how does this look and uh, how does it work? Well, you remember Johan from the video. He also uses Numi. And she's noticed that he's a bit low on potassium. He's also complained that he's a bit tired. And she's also aware of the type of food that he's been eating. So she realizes that a simple solution to this could be some bananas. But how does she communicate this to Johan? Well, she does this in the form of goals and recipes. She informs Johan that if he eats five bananas this week, this will increase his potassium and will probably uh, alleviate his fatigue. She then recommends a number of recipes. She knows that he loves pancakes, smoothies, and muesli, and recommends a number of recipes which allows him to integrate a uh, banana into his weekly eating habits. If he likes these suggestions, she'll add it to his shopping list. But this is not enough. We also need to have feedback. If users are going to change their eating habits, they need to understand how it is affecting their body. Numi does this through two touch points. As Joanna mentioned, the tactile patch will give users an overview of how they're going. But if they want a more in-depth analysis, they simply go into the application, application and Joanna can get an overview of his blood work and the long-term trends. 
In doing so, Numi creates a feedback loop which motivates users to make uh, uh, better lifestyle de decisions and educates them in understanding what nutrition means to them. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Uma. Lisa, would you like to start? Um, you don't have to. <laughs> uh, great project, beautiful presentation, um, really rich space to explore, and you, you took on so much. In some ways, um, I don't even know where to begin, because it, you... Um, the, the scope of what you created was so large. Um, and maybe the problem uh, kind of warrants that. I don't know. I mean, I was really m taken by, uh, I think from the even before the video, this idea that you could get um, instant feedback about something, um, about how food would affect you, and those icons, and actually Bill commented to you. Um, there was something, you know, I feel like there's so many moments to explore, and uh, again, I appreciate the sort of the breadth of what you created, but I also I think there were, there were moments, you know, sort of smaller moments that could have been kind of drilled into in, in more depth, too. Um, but overall, uh, I mean, we, we all need something like this. Um, the, I guess the, the conversation, if we're talking about that, seemed to jump around to diff many different forms. So I'm also curious how to reconcile that. I mean, in the end, it comes back to you know, my body and the, how the food affects me, but um, that uh, yeah, so that, that maybe that's one struggle of just how to integrate the many components of the experience. But overall, you know, incredible, and I hope something like this um, <laughs> is um, possible in the near future. So I have two questions, and you can choose to do one or the other or both. But the, the one is, I'd like to know what your picture process about the research you did so that you can separate um, what's foreseeable just through engineering as opposed to some Deus Ex Machina, magic happens here solution. So what uh, in the foundations for the chemistry that, and the printing and all these other things. So that, that's an interesting thing that um, would help take it from science fiction to, to something that's actually a plausible aspiration. And the second would be um, how to put this can you imagine this scaling down? Because the people who could afford this are probably the people who at least need more nutrition. They probably have an excess. And so there's other parts of the world where nutrition re actually is even more drastically um, problems. And can it scale to that? Do you have, have you thought, talked about that part? You can talk about research first. Yeah, okay, um, so we did explore that aspect. Um, and we tried not to base it on magic, uh, but rather things which are researched right now. Um, 3D printing peels, it's feasible now. Uh, creating them uh, in the maker, printer, uh, is also feasible, not in the size we present. Uh, but experiments like that are taking uh, place in Great Britain right now. Um, so all the components we used will be feasible in the future. Uh, also the patch. Yeah, the U.S. Army is developing a patch that does exactly that um, and actually also administers the vitamins, the supplementation, transdermically. Um, in regards to the second question, we were looking uh, at like what our target was, who we wanted to kind of, um, I guess, uh, yeah, the, for the system to apply to. Um, and in the context in which we created, we actually did about uh, over five weeks of ethnographic research, and we were based in Umeå. Uh, so we were targeting uh, the general population. Um, in terms of scaling down, I mean, that is something that I would have loved to explore. Um, however, with the resources and time, uh, it, it's not possible to cover such a breadth. But it's for sure something that could be applied in some manner or form. Hmm. Uh, 
Uh, again, congratulations on a great presentation. Um, I found uh, one of the things that I thought was actually kind of brilliant about your presentation is this identification of the problem of healthful, eating healthfully but being a feedback problem, of there being a gap between immediacy of action and sort of long-term of effect. Um, you know, I think a lot of products can be defined by the feedback that they give, whether that's the buzz of a button or an image that flashes on the screen. And that, thinking about food as a feedback problem, I thought was a really great insight. Um, one thing that I, I thought, though, is that the project could have uh, benefited from kind of becoming less rather than more, right? That by scaling back recommendations and by scaling back touch points, you almost clarify the fact of trying to give that feedback. Whereas if the feedback is too ubiquitous, it ends up becoming sort of a wall of information that becomes hard to act on. Um, so that was just one question I had. And a little bit echoing on Lisa's point that kind of the vastness of the system, which I think was really well considered insofar as you thought about what kind of feedback loop would create a virtuous cycle. I thought that you could actually make each individual uh, leg on that stool actually a little bit smaller so that the product would be a little bit clearly def more clearly defined. Mm -hmm. so, uh, a little bit. Um, I, I think when year after year, I've, I've done this a few times, um, it's always effortlessly good how, video, how the video quality and the storytelling has improved over the years, by the way. So it's like, I don't know if it's, it's got to be that we're all getting better at it. Um, but like the video was actually like almost commercial quality. You had like actual acting going on in there and like moments of drama and emotion. And, and it's, it's always worth pointing out how difficult that stuff is and how, you know, just the design of this device looks quite advanced. The, the idea of the patch with this roughness as a little twist on the design idea that it's giving you feedback as a little like a rash. I mean, there's some, some real moments of, um, of joy and kind of nice kind of creative ideas in there. Um, and I just wanted to commend you on both the presentation, the video, and the sort of executional high level thinking. So well done. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Omer. Next up, we have UCLA with Murmur, Generative Drawing with Speech. Hello, my name is Adam Ferris. I'm from the UCLA Design Media Arts Department. I'm an artist and software maker, and I mostly focus on making videos, real-time generative visuals, um, and much of my recent work has focused around uh, image processing, machine learning, uh, and so on. And I often take um, crowdsourced information from users to my work on the web so I can generate new content that way. So to get started, I wanted to share with you um, a short video clip and influence of mine of film Playtime by Jacques Tati. isn't working. Mm, we might click, oh, there you go. Um, yeah, so I really love this last quote in the end, all things electric, to know how it works, you have to know the inner being of it. 
Um, and then the way that the guard's voice is sort of echoed in the beeps in the machines and, and this vision of uh, communicating with a machine before there were machines that could talk, how he communicates with this like beeping tower and also how he communicates with the other human on the other end of it. Last fall, the University of Toronto released this demo where you could send an image to their server and it would return a string of text uh, to caption your image. So um, instead of getting back some text that was like a dirty floor and wires, I got this message about a photoshopped picture of a bathroom with the floor missing and a guy falling through the sky. Um, so, and again, I tried another one, Margaret Thatcher, a man biting into a donut with a sly look. So even though, even though the result is, is wrong, there's still a lot of delight here. And we can still gain meaningful interaction from um, things that are not necessarily working as intended. So, whoa. Um, so, let's see. I wanted to make and, oh, well, I did make an art project that collects uh, ambient speech, so whatever is being said near it, and then finds an image and sort of draws it out. So this project is mainly about finding or converting speech into images. How can we draw what we say? And um, where can we get those images? So language is complex. Hello in a search is Hello Kitty. Anyone who does language programming can tell you how difficult it can be. Um, and I wanted to use the sort of like vast resources that we already have at our disposal for generating these images. So I think in this like sort of act of converting our speech into image searches, we end up dredging up these sort of unexpected and, and delightful things. And I think there's really something magical about a machine understanding us um, when, when you see it like directly copying down your text, um, there's real, real delight there. So to put this together, I used the Microsoft Speech API, OpenCV, an open source computer vision library. Open Frameworks is a creative coding platform for artists, and GLSL, a stack of shaders or graphics programs. So to begin, someone says something, Barack Obama, and then an image search is performed and an image is grabbed at random. So of all the images of Obama, we get this one. And then it goes through some filters. We find all the edges. And then we find how to draw the image. All the contours of the image are generated. And then we get a final rendering. So it's drawn out in this sort of um, pencil fashion. And I wanted to draw in a sort of hand-done hand way to mitigate some of the sort of digital technology to kind of even railing against what the guard in that Tati video is saying. So to do something slightly more human, to make it feel drawn. And I want to put this in transit stations, elevator lobbies, or elevators themselves, wherever people are waiting. So that this is something ambiently listening. So you could use like a shotgun mic or something to detect people from afar and just pick up like sort of their, yeah, their murmurs or whatever is being said in a space. What is, the, what is the conversational tenor of a place? And how can architecture be activated through speech? Whoop. And also thinking about what remains after we leave a space. So say you and I are in this place talking we would generate some images that fly up on the wall, and as we leave, we leave behind these images. And the next people that come along can then see this echo of what has come before them. So there's a sort of residue of conversation that is left behind by this project. And going further, yet to be implemented, um, I want to eventually figure out how to do this with some kind of sentiment analysis. So are the people talking happy? Are they sad? How can we affect the visual result uh, based on their emotional state or how quickly they're talking or the kind of vocabulary they're using? Are they talking about a purple thing or are they hungry? Can we serve them some kind of useful content or image like um, sort of, I mean, maybe subliminally almost. So 
I want to try and show this live. It's a little buggy, but bear with me. So I've been recording my speech throughout this uh, talk. And then with any luck. We'll get something, hopefully. Maybe not. <laughs> okay. So, live demos are always risky. <laughs> Okay, hello. Okay, so yeah, whatever I'm saying, we should be able to uh, perform searches on it. And in searching for things that, like conversation does not necessarily equate uh, good images. Um, <laughs> But I think there's, there's like some really fun in this misunderstanding, or, or even not misunderstanding, but um, yeah, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what, so what like random images are, are attached to our words? Um, yes, so this is it. Yeah, so uh, it's, I mean, first of all, props for trying a live demo in a situation like this. That's, and, and the fact that you built this is um, also huge at Microsoft and anywhere that um, there's this kind of thing going on. Um, it's one thing to think it, it's another thing to build it. Um, <laughs> oh shit, I'm really scared now. <laughs> or we could have fun with this. Um, no, so, um, jeez. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, this is the beauty of what you've done is that there is fun in mm -hmm. and and creativity in the accident of the machine misunderstanding, right. and um, there's an important artistic observation that you've made, and you've made it very well. So congratulations. Thank I'll you. Hand it over gingerly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sure. <laughs> so I, I thought that this is a, a really beautiful and poetic project. Um, the idea of linking all these different pieces of technology together to create something that's more than those pieces, um, I thought was really beautifully done. And the kind of um, the inspiration from Tati, I think, which is really great. I mean, one of the great design films of all time, for sure. Um, one thing I wonder is, you know, if in the future, like, how you'll begin to evolve the drawing language mm -hmm. of this, because one thing that, one intriguing thing you mentioned is the idea of sentiment analysis, right? Mm -hmm. And that, to me, suggests that if you have a different sentiment with different emotional tenors, then the drawing style should change. Exactly. So, so like, someone fraught could be a, a wigglier line or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I think the current style, I think, has its own charm in that it's, vaguely sinister and kind of like the the faces all get sort of like washed out and kind of terrifying looking but uh this is great it made me think that you know what it, you know it would be also great to see that see this as like an almost eavesdropping project right it's, right it's it's interesting to see like the product of a conversation you can't even hear you know what i mean happening in real time but in any event congratulations thank you um first you should Submit this to the uh, Ars Electronica oh. <laughs> uh, and then you can get it deployed. 
But the, it's actually what's fun about this is in it's serious play. It provokes other things like privacy. Um, can you create enough delight that people are happy to have the conversations captured in microphone? And then how do you build, have the trustification that lets me know that it's passing through and not buffered? And mm -hmm. and those are all part of the design thing that where it hinges on success or where would it be appropriate or not? But the but I like things like this that are provocative because they force one to think about technology in very, very different ways. Um, it's not sinister, even though it, you know, the images are. Um, and, and I think that notion of provoking thought is maybe the, the fundamental thing, but also to realize there's other possibilities and we don't have to expect, accept things the way they are. And I think that that's the essence of art. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Echo all of that um, really provocative and beautifully done and suggestive. It's, it seems like a s <laughs> landscape. Oh, uh, it just seems like it's sort of begging for ideas, questions, um, future iterations, and I hope all of those things happen as a result. Congratulations. I think it should be a screensaver on Surface Hub and ship with all units. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Next, we have Carnegie Mellon University with Opus, connecting parents and children with the power of story. Um, so, Hi, everybody. Uh, we are Carnegie, Carnegie Mellon University School of Design. And well, my name is Dixon, and these are my teammates, Sarah and ji um, We were thinking we might start with a little bit of audience participation. So um, with a show of hands, how many people out here are parents? All right. So how many of you have asked your children the question, how was your day, and gotten back some sort of answer that sounded like, OK. <laughs> All right. Keep your hands up. So for everybody that's left, how many of you are guilty of giving your parents this answer? OK, so this is the problem we're trying to solve, that um, maybe rich conversation doesn't arise from questions like, how was your day? They come about when parents have a bit more information to ask a more specific question about a child's experience. So we were thinking, how can we deliver this, uh, deliver this information to parents? And this is how we're going to do it. This is Opus, and it's... Uh, Augmented Reality Magnifying Glass and an e-paper, a bound e-paper storybook. And uh, what it can do is it can take the experiences the child has during the day and kind of slip them into story time later at night. And this is how we uh, arrived at our, uh, at our final uh, solution. It's, um, we started out with interviews, uh, both individual and group, and then we went on to do some generative workshops. And then the insights from these, we generated almost 100 concepts. And then with our users, we narrowed them down to just a few to prototype, and then we came back uh, to our users again for validation. And throughout this entire process, um, we came up with, I think, our three key insights. So insight number one is the existence of our problem, that um, how is your day doesn't actually generate a rich conversation. And if there's only some way we could give parents a bit more information so they could ask something specific about their child's experience. Um, insight number two is that maybe story time is actually a great place to deliver this information because story time is a ritual that many families have almost daily. And within story time, um, Conversation is already a natural mode of interaction between parent and children. So it's not a big step to try to augment story time a little to encourage parents and children to talk a little bit more about themselves or ask a bit more about each other. And uh, number three was that some of the parents we, we were talking to were a bit concerned about technology coming in between them and their kids. So we found that when we, um, when we wrapped up our information in the familiar vehicle of a story and the familiar f uh, physical form of a story book, they suddenly became a lot more comfortable using our technology. Our system is a, oh, sorry. Our system is a symbiosis between three actors. Stories are co-created with input that is one-third from the child, one-third from the parent, and one-third from the Opus framework. For this to work, the child explores their day with a magnifying glass. These, their discoveries are archived in the story for, for later use. 
Um, the OPIS framework relies heavily on databases for st storytelling structure, for prose and illustration style, as well as child education related material or research. And finally, the parent joins the child with OPIS to imagine these stories. Here is our concept video. So she uses OPIS, an augmented storybook and magnifying glass that helps parent and child share experiences through the power of story. While her mother is at work, the daughter Riley discovers things with the magnifying glass. How are you guys today? She finds things that interest her. It's beautiful. And she finds things that she wants to remember. Each time Riley focuses the magnifying glass on an object, it comes alive and talks to her. Hello, Riley. My name is George. Do you know who I am? You're a ball? Yes, I am a tennis ball. I bounce here and bounce there. Let's go on an adventure together. Look for me in the book later. Later that night, story time begins. Opus actively listens to Jill and Riley's conversation. Are you ready for the story? Yep. Once upon a time, there was a... What was there, Riley? A girl. And that girl's name was... What was her name? Me, Riley. Riley lived with her... Who did she live with? Teddy. And Riley and Teddy lived on a farm. They were best friends. No. What do you mean, no? You love teddy bears. We're enemies now. Oh, I see. Riley and Teddy were enemies. Oh, what's that? It's a tennis ball. I found it today. Oh, really? Have you played tennis before? Do you want to try? Yeah. Let's plan to do that for the weekend. Riley and Teddy were rival tennis players, and this is their story. Later, the story is done, and Riley has gone to sleep. Jill sets up the next story with Opus. Opus? Hello, Jill. Would you like to talk about the next story? Yeah, I noticed that Riley's very concerned about winning. That is fairly common for her age. The possible solution is to emphasize the qualities that helped her get there, not the result itself. Should we add that in for the next time? Good to know. That sounds fantastic. Great. I'll save that. Do you want to review the summary? No, I will read it for the first time with Riley. Now that Jill has Opus, Story time has taken on new meaning. With Opus, the telling of each new story is a chance for parents to teach, for children to reflect, and a chance for both of them to bond. So you just saw a day in the life with Opus. And the experience of Opus um, can be characterized into five steps. Let me take you each step in more detail. First is discover. The child uses the magnifying glass to discover the world around her. And as a magnifying glass recognizes that chosen object, it initiates a conversation through interactive AR characters to keep the child engaged in the activity. Second is co-create. During story time, parent and child can co-create stories by completing unfinished narratives um, by un Narratives. <laughs> this feature was modeled after an actual observed behavior from parents when they make up stories for their children. And also, Opus uses a three-act story structure, setup, confrontation, and resolution to combine these seemingly random elements into one cohesive narrative. Third is experience. Opus is actively listening to the conversation between parent and child and creating the next content in real time. So although Opus is not contributing vocally, the story is still told by three actors, child, parent, and Opus. And fourth is share and learn. The previously captured elements appear in the story um, to to become a starting point for conversation, allowing parents to ask more engaging questions to find further, further insights into the child's experiences. And last is reflect and plan. Many of the parents that we interviewed with wanted to learn more about the child's experiences and interests so they can help them better. So the, the, so the act of planning the story together with Opus is a great opportunity for parents to learn about the empirical research behind the plot points and also to carry that knowledge into real life. And also here is where parents can review content and select narrative, illustration, author styles, and etc.
So up to this point, we've only discussed opus within an immediate family environment involving parent and child. But we envision opus to be in a bigger context. So what if extended family members, aunts, grandparents, uncles, can start contributing in storytelling? It will be a great way to connect distant family members and also an opportunity for parents to teach children about family rules and values. So, for us, the biggest takeaway from this project was a renewed respect for storytelling. And this respect is why we've created Opus, a system that enhances the ritual of story time and also helps families to connect with one another through the power of storytelling. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hello. Thank Thanks. Um, so congratulations on your project. Uh, I, I will say that insights that you guys led off with, um, I thought were really powerful and succinct and really clear, clear in their presentation. And it, it, the quality of your process and your research really showed through. And I think set you up for a lot of success later on, right? Um, as you gave this presentation, like I, I started wondering, like why would anybody want to go through their day collecting this information? And then when you showed the magnifying glass actually personifying things in the world around, I thought that was a brilliant brilliant solution to actually making somebody want to do that, to giving some reward in using the project product. Um, one thing I did wonder, though, is that like I, I thought that there was a little bit of ambiguity about whether or not the product was about co-creating a new story with the child or letting them reconstruct their day in story-like form, right? And those two aren't necessarily the same thing. Like They would suggest different prompts, a different UX for that storybook, right? And that was one question I had is like, had you thought about the UX of that storybook and how it would prompt you? Because one thing that's interesting about conversational UI is that the tenor of the conversation, the content of the conversation actually becomes UX, right? The words that you use, the blanks that are there and that kind of th stuff. Um, so I'm wondering if you guys thought about what that, what that interaction was like. I think it's, um, we actually, only presented one uh, one scenario in this book, but then when we were designing it, we were thinking there were a few levels of possibility. Um, some parents might actually uh, feel really tired and they don't want to to like make a story, so then the book would just write it all for them. Um, to answer your question, um, um, I think that uh, it's it's more about uh, creating a new story rather than talking about the child's day. Um, and the, the tenor or the, the language in the book uh, is actually set up at the end of the book where you could see when the parent was talking to the book, she could actually choose illustrator style and uh, kind of writer style. Um, and those will kind of dictate how, like you could choose the Dr. Seuss version of the book and then it would talk like Dr. Seuss and uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, um, beautiful, amazing presentation and uh, I, I I love the premise, um, and I agree with Cliff that the way you you set up those initial uh, this kind of the strategy, the principles um, was really strong. Str so strong, in fact, that um, as a parent, I kind of immediately wanted it to be a particular thing. Um, and I don't know if this is useful to state, but. Um, I, the, the illustration part kind of threw me in the actual sort of creation of the story, because I think even if it were, now I'm just kind of brainstorming with you, but like, even if there were just something, um, an aid for parents, you, you always have to come up with like a new and better story um, at bedtime. Um, and I think something that would aid a parent that also, again, sort of um, brings the child into the story, re revealing something about his or her day, was so powerful. You had me kind of there. And then, again, I mean, I love the ambition of bringing in the illustration and the book, but it, it prob I think it would be successful even um, with less. And, uh, but again, for, for the, the spirit of this project, um, I understand the desire to sort of keep, <laughs> keep going. I mean, I think that that was the case with a couple other projects that we saw as well. But uh, I hope I hope you continue with this, and I think there there is something really valuable um, that probably would be less work even that could come out of this. 
So I totally identify with the problem statement as it was both my daughters are actually in the audience, future future designers, and every single day is the how did how was your day? <laughs> and the nothing. Um, <laughs> Except the uh, output of their creativity, and that's where we actually have great conversations. And yesterday, my younger daughter was showing me her Sims uh, basement house that she, you know, designed, and um, it was you know third floor of her fifteenth house that she's built, and she was imagining the persona of the person who lived there and decorating it appropriately for this particular individual. And, and it, is, it reminded me of the exactly what you're doing, which is the point is to engage the parents in a conversation through creativity and how can a conversational assistant sort of bring magic to that. So it reminds me a little bit of the last project we saw in terms of you know, just immediately providing the sort of starting points for a conversation and stimulating that with provocation and all sorts of things. I think there's so many levels I could talk about your project. I could go on for like 20 minutes, but um, I'll stop there. But uh, I really liked it and some, some really uh, very deep and thoughtful thinking about the future of um, sort of guided co-creation. And um, I, I really enjoyed it. Thanks. Bill, you want to? Oh, we do it time. OK. That'll okay. be too long. Okay. Thank you. Next up, we have Art Center College of Design with Transactor, a UX for AI. Hi, everyone. I'm Lee. I'm Shay. I'm Xing. We're from Art Center College of Design, and we're presenting Transactor a UX for AI. Current conversational interface imitate humans. But why? Computer have its own strengths and weakness. It have its own um, way of processing the decision making. And it literally speaks a different language. Computer needs its own unique identity. And we believe this new identity will help the user better understand how their computer works, and the computer devices will be also able to perform a more customized task, a more productive search, and also a more collaborative uh, interactions. But to have a better collaborations, we need a Creole, a lingua franca. What we're proposing here is a designed language for AI-based computational actors, like, com like com conversational interface. This new language mediates communication between human and computational actors, and also it improve human to computation relationship. And in this way, we can talk with, uh, like something, we talk with someone from different country, just like when I talk with Lee, I always use my body language and instead of speaking, speaking English. So we're arguing that developing user experience from transparency will help to create this new computational identity. What, what we mean by transparency is that users should be able to understand what the computer is doing and why. In this way, conversations can become more nuanced and meaningful. So, to create this new transparent language, we looked at creating a conversational interface that communicates emotions uh, by producing a working CUI. We then looked at how that interface might respond non-verbally by building a chatbot that only responds with GIFs, and then looking at what a natively computational form might look like through a series of form studies. Uh, so based on our research, we then developed four individual working prototypes that use light, sound, motion, and behavior to communicate non-verbally. Essentially, we transformed the current notion of a CUI as a, a disembodied voice in a black box and 
transformed it into a set of embodied uh, networked objects. These objects communicate with the user through distinct nonverbal uh, <laughs> distinct nonverbal modalities. This facilitates the conversation and helps the user understand how the machine is operating. So we isolated each of these nonverbal methods of communication into its own module to better understand how it works. The light module shows how the computer is listening to the user. It uses the color and brightness of the LEDs to give a general impression of how the computer is receiving the input. This is analogous of how we use facial expressions in our communication. The audio module reveals next computer's actions. We've used tones to indicate that the, that the computer is currently thinking and to communicate some of the details of the task it is about to start. This is model after filler words like hmm, huh, and wow. So all these words indicate how the, uh, uh, indicates the speaker has more to say. The motion module indicates the status of the text that the computer is currently working on. Um, it functions as postures and gestures during human-to-human -human communications, revealing the response to current task. And the behavior module, um, it shows the general status of the computer. Just like uh, we can tell if someone's stressed or tired by their behavior or the bag under their eyes, the user can tell how taxed the computer is by the speed of the fan cooling the CPU. So we think that this sort of communication system can best be applied to a, a higher level sort of ideation process. We have an example here of a script writer using this system to help figure out some of the details of a scene. I want like a bright color with an appropriate symbolic meaning. Can you give me some suggestions? Green. Really? Why green? Color symbolism databases, 80% green for ominous scene, related results, death, decay, non-human monsters. Yeah, but I just don't like green for this. What about some color that symbolizes poison in nature? Like poisonous frogs, or snakes, or something like that. Yellow and black patterns. Mm, no, I think I want something really evil. Can you give me some evil qualities? Crime, immorality, corruption, control, harm. Um, okay. Can we check these against the color symbolism databases? Red. Hmm, yeah. Yeah, I think that works. So, our hope is that these four modules, light, sound, motion, and behavior, can augment the standard voice output of current CUIs uh, with nonverbal subjective indicators. These add an element of native computational behavior that more closely resembles our experiences talking with other people. We explore user experience for artificial intelligence to create distinctly computational identity, which will help users to better understand and converse with their computational agents. And we choose this form to move away from human-centric, but toward a native computational appearance. Additionally, we want to emphasize the physical interactions between user and computers, so the two are able to um, trust each other, uh, learn each other habits, and grow a close relationship. This system aims to communicate through multiple channels and with redundancies. Its transparent user experience design helps the user understand how the system operates, which changes their behavior. This then allows the system to understand them. 
uh, with this altered behavior, the system affords more in-depth interactions, which helps produce a more collaborative relationship. So this work has raised a few questions. From these prototypes, we found that knowing more about what the computer is doing and how it works, it makes the computer strangely more personable. So can we relate more to computers by making them less like us? And with uh, more conversational interactions, how do we differentiate demands and conversation? And what is and what can be the relationship between machines and human? With every computational device having its own identity, what sort of characteristics emerge as native qualities or behaviors? Do these change per device? Uh, will the brand affect its behaviors? Can the user change its, uh, its characteristics? We hope this project is an interesting provocation that leads to uh, further user testing, more experimentation. We hope ultimately that it changes how we think about artificially intelligent and conversational systems. Thank you. Thank you. Um, provocative work, as I always expect from OutCenter, um, and thoughtful. And um, I love this idea that there are, you know, artificial intelligence is exactly that. It isn't human intelligence. It's it's very different, and the many different kinds of artificial intelligence could be embodied in very different kinds of subjective inputs and outputs. Um, you've really gone on a very daring path here with this project in terms of you've you know you've taken on some really challenging sort of ideas, and I think pushed the conversation in a really nice way. Um, so I want to commend you for that. There's really some bold thinking here. Um, the devices themselves totally like beguiling, you know, um, fascinating things um, that you know you can you can leave you a little cold, right? I mean, in terms of their provocations about what could be ways to express the artificialness of that intelligence, um, um, but um, you know, I. I uh, but they are so unintuitive that you're kind of like you're puzzled at the same time, right? Like they're so kind of like they so challenge the idea of human computer interaction um, that you're like you find this very hard um, way of relating to them. Um, so anyway, I, I, I commend you for going on such a bold journey and um, I think the results are super interesting and provocative. So well done. Uh, I echo what Rob is saying. I mean, um, not I'm, not, I'm not speaking when I say this about student work um, here, but often with student work, you find them solving problems that are not necessarily current to present design issues. And this is actually one that's absolutely current to the moment that we're in, this issue of whether or not we want these artificially intelligent things to be represented as human. Um, it's someone I know, for example, that Microsoft has thought a lot about. Um, the thing that I wonder, though, and the thing, though, I wonder about, like, what is next about this is that, like, I find a lot of these uh, details actually totally convincing, especially, like, the light is a, a way of indicating attention span and things like that. But as you move away from skeuomorphic representations, one of the challenges is that as soon as you get, get away from that, the mappings become much more complex and hard to sort of grok unless you have a code, right? So that requires this user testing to see whether or not this thing really means what you think it means with real life users. But do enough of that research and then you end up with skeuomorphic representations, like I'm speaking faster when I'm nervous or whatever. Um, so I'm wondering if you guys thought about like what that next step is, validating whether or not these, these, these codes are actually meaningful for people. Yeah, so we based a lot of our work on, we did extensive research into linguistics, uh, specifically nonverbal communication and uh, communicating emotions uh, through language. And we started off trying to communicate emotions, but the sort of computer analog. Um, and so right now what we're communicating, what it communicates is uh, how the computer is working. So like the, uh, the LED module will analyze what the user says and it'll report sentiment analysis. Uh, so we're essentially trying to create analogs from nonverbal communication in the computational realm. 
Hi. <laughs> I'm not sure I understood all that, but um, yes, extremely provocative and kind of crazy project, delightfully so. Uh, I mean, it also may be contradictory in some ways because our models for artificial intelligence and, you know, even the way you described it, um, they are human centric. Um, so, uh, but I, I was interested, I feel like it would have helped to, I'm sure you did this in your research, but um, it would have helped to be very specific about what are the ways that computers are really different from humans. And I wonder where that would have taken you. Um, I mean, for, for example, um, I think the, the sort of input output, um, I mean, just understanding that a computer is going through, um, you know, 600,000 database records or, you know, just if it was transparent about what it was actually doing. I liked the goal of um, uh, sort of educating us about how, you know, what the, what the computer is doing for us and how it's serving us. And um, it was interesting in the video that you had some of that sort of data feedback layered on the objects. And so maybe, maybe that could have been part of the representation as well. Um, anyway, but I'm you know, totally intrigued, sort of, um, I liked the, the conceptual art piece of it, but I also like you know, how it's sort of, um, yeah, how, how it's asking, it, it's, it's forcing us to ask questions about AI. Um, do you? <laughs> yeah, so there's, there's a guy, he, he died prematurely, but named Clifford Nass, who um, had this notion that we project human properties onto machines no matter how uh, unhuman-like they are. And so as that is gonna be more strongly uh, present when things are actually starting to speak to us in a fluent voice as if they actually were human. And this notion to counter that, because what brings out is that the, all of these assumptions that they know more than they really do, and they can do what they can't. And so how do you actually limit the, the conversation so that you are constantly reminded and don't fall into that trap, which is just natural behavior, and you, so you put by design a block that constantly reminds you in a way that you can't ignore, and I think that that's how I read what you're you're doing. And if you don't know his work, read it because it'll be it'll give you lots of ammunition to go on further. But I, I think that this is a really important thing to be doing, and I think it's even in cases we have to distort the voices, even so that I know which personality has. If you, if I speak to you in German, you can tell I don't speak German. So if you're a native speaker, you're going to answer me in broken German. To, to work within my vocabulary, and I have to present my limitations to you. And if I spoke to you with one key phrase that I spoke fluently, you're gonna come and I'm lost. Mm -hmm. and, and because I set expectations by practicing being a smart ass, I, I actually messed up. And, and I think that's true with the machines. So I think there's something going on in the conversation here that's really important and it's really interesting. And I really liked Cliff's work and I'm glad to see it reflected uh, one way or another in what you're doing. Thank you, Art Center. Next, we have University of Dundee from the United Kingdom with Auto Communication Aid for Autistic Children. Hi, everyone. I'm Kamer, and this is Sarah. We're Hi. going to be speaking to you today. And this is the rest of the team bringing out Auto. So we have Sean, Kame, Andrew, and Jenna here as well. So why did we pick autism? Autism is something that's really close to all of us as a team, whether it's a little brother or a cousin with a condition or a family member that works with autistic children. And we were also really excited to see how we could implement the conversational side of conversational user interface and run it alongside the problems that autistic children have with communication. Uh, so this is Callum. Callum's my little cousin, he's 12 years old, and he has a specific set of behaviours, like the other autistic kids that we spoke to, that label him as autistic. So these include having trouble in social situations, uh, having trouble expressing and actually like, displaying his emotions, 
And this goes to the extent where he can't even speak to his mum or his sister, to the people that are closest to him in his life. So when, C when we sat down with Callum, we asked him, who would he speak to? And he came up with the idea of speaking to his favourite cartoon character, SpongeBob SquarePants. So from this, we took that if we made a character, it would promote a lot more interaction between the child and the actual device. So another issue they face is they get frustrated at the littlest things that wouldn't bother like you or me. And they measure this frustration on a set of five scales that Sarah's going to talk to you about. We focused on the first four stages as this is when the situation can be controlled and brought down to a normal level. Stages one and two is when the child is vocally receptive so the parent can talk to the child and calm them down before the situation escalates. Stages three and four is when the child is unable to communicate verbally and this is when Otto would come in to calm the child down with our interactions. Now we're going to present to you our project video. Hi, I'm Otto. beneficial um, especially because it tunes in to the child as an individual. See you later. So we looked at three specific types of people. The child who is the user so we wanted to gain an insight in what they thought. Then we looked at the parent and then teachers and then researchers. So we wanted to gain their professional point of view. This is Professor Annalou Waller. She designs communication systems for and with non-speaking individuals. Annalou was intrigued at how Otto was predictable and non-judgmental as Otto gave clear outputs to the user. We then spoke to um, Julie, Julie Wall, who's a teacher who works with autistic children. Um, her insight was very valuable in our research as she suggested that we adapted Otto to fit each child's individual needs. We're now going to present to you our video, our research video that show the interviews. What he's doing with the robot is actually giving the child a way to express or to, to be with something. It's and there's a lot of things that he finds confusing and can be very distressing for him that it would be an ideal time to sit with Otto um, and have some time, time for, for himself. So we also went along and spoke to the parents at the National Autism Society, which is one of the biggest charities for autism in the UK. And it became really apparent really early that we needed to make Otto as more of a guide towards conversation between the child and the parent. It couldn't act as a sever between the two. So another thing they picked up on, they absolutely loved the tactile, non-judgmental and um, non-provocative game on top. We'll get into it. And they also really liked the characterization of Otto, giving the child something to sort of look into and trust. So from their feedback, we ended up moving on with the interface on top to design a light game as a calming element. We also changed the base uh, to make it a bit more suitable for child children. And a common theme that was brought up by a lot of the parents was that if something had happened to their child, that was outside of the parent's supervision, they 
and they had already escalated to a stage where they weren't vocally receptive. And then when they came in, say they were out playing football and something happened, they came into the house, there was already that sever of connection between the child and the parent. They couldn't talk to them and that could be frustrating. So the child would normally go into their bedroom, lie on the, their bed and stare at the ceiling. This was a common theme brought up by the parents. So we thought if we had a projection on the roof to just sort of grab their interest and draw them in to interact with Otto, it would be a more of a non-invasive sort of passive way to bring them in. And once Otto and the child were uh, motivated to interact, we would start with a um, light game. Uh, this light game is designed to be non-frustrating and non-competitive so that it's not going to provoke and frustrate the child by losing it. So the light game is essentially a light that will pop up on the dome. When the child puts its hand over it, the light will go away. And then when the child takes its hand off, another light will come up and they'll repeat the process. And this is used as a calming measure to bring them down the stages to a stage where they are vocally receptive. And once the child is brought down to a stage where they are vocally receptive, Otto will start to try to communicate. So Otto will open up. And once this is open, this is sort of a signaling as Otto is going to speak. So it adds to that predictability element that autistic children love. So once Otto is ready to communicate, it will suggest something from Otto's AI that builds up a sort of relationship with the child to understand the child and what the child likes. So Otto will suggest maybe playing a light game or watching a movie. And then it will monitor the body language and tone of voice of the child to then uh, make, a, uh, make a decision whether it's a positive or negative reaction. If it's a positive reaction, it can build on this and go forward with calming the child down. If it's a negative reaction, it'll take a step back, reassess, and maybe go from a different angle, like watch a movie instead. So once the child is down to a level where they are vocally receptive and able to speak, Otto will send a text to the parent to include them and to let them know that the child is ready to speak and that they might suggest playing a game or something to distract the child while they talk about the issue and solve the original frustration and problem. And then once the child is finished uh, speaking to Otto, if he doesn't want to interact, he can just tell him, go to sleep. And that's Otto away. So thank you folks, that's us. If you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. I'll go. Um, I thought that the um, this connection between a, like a, a, the progression of interactions through an object evolving into like a full-on character design, I thought was actually really there's something about that that evolution of the project product being something different depending on what kind of interactions you're having, and then eventually opening up and having this sort of more clam-like interaction with the eyes and things like that. I thought that was really, really nicely done. I think what was, um, what I left myself wondering was uh, what is, what exactly is the, like, the user journey, like, what, what exactly is the interaction, like, what is the problem that's being solved and how are you, how are you going through that? I, you know, I just, what I, what I was having a little bit of trouble seeing is actually what exactly what the use case was that you guys were trying to get in, get at. Okay, so, um, you're getting me. Hold on. so basically, when the child gets frustrated, they can go into a state where they're non-verbal, so they're not verbally receptive. And it can be really hard for parents not being able to speak to their child, so they can't actually ask them what's wrong, because they'll just ignore them and head. This is usually when they're at these stages three and four, they just want to be alone. They don't want to actually speak to anyone. And that's when their vocal reactions start to go down and their physical reactions start to go up. So we looked at basically ha having an introduction with physical reactions so that they're more likely to want to interact rather than being probing and asking them questions and things just straight away. Mm -hmm. And then once they do start communicating, it can really relay them to the parent. Yeah, I mean, it, it seems in many ways uh, the kind of flip side to the previous um, presentation and using um, using the the technology for uh, and using the projection of 
just the the you know a certain amount of human interaction for good. I mean, a non-judgmental, um, disembodied. Anyway, it's interesting how it how it plays with the previous one. I mean, it and uh, I can see how it could um, I mean, sort of moving from an object and a piece of technology and sort of bringing on the human interaction and sort of setting the stage for um, apparent interaction. Um, I could see that it'd be incredibly valuable for that. And, you know, I, I don't know how many of us sort of fully understand the, um, the problem space, but sort of trusting that, I mean, you described it actually very well with the phases. Uh, and I, I could definitely see that this would provide an amazing solution. And it was really well presented. And, um, and the fact that you have a prototype here is quite impressive, too. So again, thanks. Thanks a lot. And that's actually interesting how you've attacked the problem at a whole bunch, or addressed the problem on a whole bunch of levels, and with a f fairly high level of detail. And it's, so I, I really appreciate that. I, from the design perspective, I look at this thing, and I, I'm overwhelmed about two things. First of all, I got goosebumps watching that video, just when the little kids sort of wrapped around, and it's just like, I, how dare you tear my emotions? That. <laughs> unexpectedly. Um, it, it was really effective. But it's also a fascinating how much personality you've gotten into such a simple thing. And, and But also it draws you in that because he's just peeking out, you have to lean down. It's a physical action, which is really important in, in this particular type of situation. And, and where you have to come in, it's intimate, and so it is personal, it's, so it's, which makes it safer. And and, it, and just the eyes. There's just some very, it, it's really easy to make things hard. This, it's really hard to make things get that much out of that little and uh, that effectively. And, and it augurs really well for what you're doing. And so if the same qualities are affecting the rest of your thinking, it, it gives credibility to that even when you don't have time to go into the details in, in this short presentation. Thank you, Dundee. Next, we have New York University with Warren, a friendly guide for managers and a friendly guide and manager for freelancers. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jia, this is Lee Rohn, FY and Peiyu. And we're four creative technologists from NYU ITP. And this is Warren. Warren is a friendly guide and manager for freelancers. But before I tell you more about Warren, I want to tell you a little bit more about us. So Lee Rohn and I just recently graduated from ITP. Before graduation, we talked to a lot, of, a lot of our classmates, and a lot of people were talking about what we're, what we're going to do next. And this kept on coming up. Freelance, as both a goal and as necessity. So as creative young people, we really crave freedom and control over our, our own work. And at the same time, a lot of traditional full-time jobs have become independent contract work anyway. We're not alone. Four million people graduate every year, more and more becoming freelancers. Joining 53 million freelancers in this country, that's a third of the workforce. And by the year 2020, 40% would become freelancers. Yet a lot of students are not prepared for what it entails to be a freelancer. These are some of the common words that comes up a lot. What is it actually like to be a freelancer? The best thing is you get to set your own schedule. You get to choose who you work for and what you work on. But the worst thing is, you can often feel like you're totally alone with no one to guide you. You might, you might have basic questions like how much you charge a client and just not being sure about a lot of things. There are tons of software out there for to-dos, project management, or for invoicing. Here are four tools that some more experienced freelancers are already using. But many freelancers actually don't use any management software. 
That's because none of these software alone addresses the challenges that are unique to young freelancers. They don't provide guidance and they don't provide emotional support, which a conversational user interface can actually come in handy. Now let's, in, uh, let's bring back our Warren, our solution. Warren is a guide and manager for young freelancers. He's able to interact with freelancers via SMS, email, and Facebook Messenger. He's personalized for each individual freelancer. He provides guidance, answers questions, and does management within platforms freelancers are already using. He aims to make the business side of freelancing simple and maybe even a little bit fun by providing a conversational user interface approach to this application. And there are three components in Warren. The manager is the core software that includes managing and scheduling client communications, as well as keeping track of expenses and invoices. The guide helps the freelancers through in the entire workflow, answers personalized questions, and provides project tips and suggestions. And also, Warren provides daily inspiration support for freelancers to help motivate them. The more freelancers talk to Warren, the better Warren becomes as he gathers more and more information. Warren gets to know the freelancers like where they are based, how much experience they've had, their work style and personality, as well as their rates. And Warren draws knowledge from existing sources, turning them into playful conversations. If the existing sources don't exist, it will be handled by a human agent. And now let's see it in action. Warren is also interested in knowing the start date and also the end date. And last but not least, the rate of the project. As we can see, judges replies. And here's what Warren needs to note. And a week later, let's see what happens. After such a cool demo, let's see what's actually behind the Warren. Uh, this is the whole system diagram of the Warren looks like. In the front end, Warren has the ability to transfer the same content into different formats in order to have the ability to have a conversation with users into different platforms. And after the natural language understanding process, Warren will get to understand what actually users want and extract some answers from our existing source. If there's no existing answers, our human agency will come up to answer the question and such a response will add it to the library. And Warren also has the ability to help users to manage their time and doing scheduling time, scheduling work by directly taking usage of the third-party APIs. And uh, this is, there are all the integrations we already implemented. We want you, Warren to have the ability to help users to manage their email and the SMS, such that we use the poster marker, Facebook Messenger, and Twilio. And uh, in the back end, we use the Google Calendar to manage the time, Slack for our, for our human agency to answer questions online. And we really hope to use LinkedIn in future.
And in our design process, we started with general idea of who this is for and narrowed down our target user based on interviews. We had initially planned to focus on financial management and interview the CPA from Iceland Amber. It helped us get a lot of insight into how young people manage their finance and work. And we also did long interviews with students who plan to freelance, independent artists and experienced freelancers in different disciplines. We learned that different people have different kinds of challenges and questions, but they all share the same common workflow. So we started diagramming their workflow. Starting from top, a freelancer most often get client through email regular, and then they get to know each other, negotiate the project. Then they finalize their relationship with a signed agreement. Once they start working, they manage their expenses and invoices. Finally, they schedule a debrief. So what are our next steps? We have a working prototype we're user testing right now and based on that iterating the, pro the product as well as the tone of Warren and plan to beta launch with limited users. So we're part of BotCamp and Warren's part of BotCamp, it started by Betaworks, it's a top VC firm in, based out of New York City. We were told by an experienced typographer that a great independent talent must be great at the art of business. So we want to help all freelancers do what they love while conquering the art of business. Thank you. So, I mean, I, it wasn't a abundantly clear until somebody said we'd already finished integrating it into all these platforms that this is real. Um, yeah, so I mean, um, and then you finished obviously by saying you're approaching beta and all of that. But um, so maybe you could give me some sense of, of, of sort of the limitations of where you're at in terms of what are the challenges you've had getting to this point? What are, what's the roadblock now from a technology point of view? I mean, it's it's amazing that you're this far along, this, you've, you're head and shoulders above everybody else in terms of um, getting this to be a real thing, and um, I'm sort of curious where you're where you're blocked now. Um, so that maybe you could yeah, take a that. So um, one of the block, well, f first from the design perspective, there's the block of figuring out exactly what is the workflow that can be uh, personalized for each person and based on what kind of work they do. For for instance, a photographer works very differently, like their work scope is very different from an, an illustrator. Um, so figuring out how to generalize that um, and tweaking the prototype is one challenge. In terms of technology, um, there are actually a lot of um, free uh, tools for, for like doing NLU, and um, Microsoft provides a lot of tools as well, um, like the bot framework. Um, and so using some of the existing uh, platforms out there, we, we were able to prototype fairly quickly. And in terms of actually scaling up, I think that's something that we can worry about once people actually <laughs> do like it or use it, yeah. Uh, congratulations on like building something and going so far with it. I, w I, I will say like one of the things that immediately jumped out to me is that this use case for chatbots actually makes a ton of sense insofar as like there really is an interaction problem with all of these different tools that you use to manage workflow and you sort of is a when you get put in, 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 into the freelance life, you have to manage all these different inputs, basically. So I, I actually see the use case there being really compelling. And this is like a, an instance where you can actually take a lot of complexity out of the system by just creating one natural interface for all these different things. The thing that I wonder about um, further down the line, though, is that chatbots tend to be a little bit restrictive in terms of how they view the flow of information, right? They're not yet able to handle something, handle a process that's messy or different every time, it very much has to draw you through like this flow of like you do A, B, C, then D, right? And then the question then is like for a user, as a human user whose process may or may not fit into that flow every time, like what I do think could actually keep you interacting with this thing is actually if it handles a lot of stuff that you would just rather never have to handle, like integrations with doing your taxes, things like that. And so like to me, that's like where the rubber meets the road in terms of real use cases, like whether or not you can actually dissolve a lot of that complexity further down the line that will make me willing to adjust my workflow to the, ch to the limitations of the chatbot. 
Uh, yeah, I um, I have a Warren named Jane, uh, <laughs> and um, she's based in New York right now, and I'm in Portland, and it, our interaction is very similar to what you described there. And I love that, um, I mean, for me, Jane, you know, like a lot of creative people, I really hate dealing with money. Um, and uh, Jane, like Warren, is, is sort of... Um, I think the the warmth and the you know lack of judgment and um, and the support are there's such important features for this. So I, I commend you for sort of making that a top priority. And then um, all sorts of questions. I'd be happy, by the way, to um, share my Jane experiences if you need any more input for Warren. Um, interested in you know yeah is it connected to your bank account, um, will it take out what you need for taxes and all that stuff. Um, so it seems like something you know many of us could take advantage of, and, and congratulations. Uh, two quick questions then. One is, um, so when did you reach Fusion? Like, um, when did you start using Warren yourself, and have you? And if so, uh, what does Warren tell you about how to monetize this? <laughs> Um, so the first question was, um, the idea really came up because of this anxiety that crept over a lot of us, I think, when, since we were last semester in grad school and trying to figure out, you know, next up and we want to be independent. And I had done a lot of freelancing myself before, and this was a big pain point. And just thinking about that and talking to a classmate who said how her friend hates spreadsheet, and she was like, oh, she can't do all this stuff because she hates spreadsheet. And that got me really nervous, and I started a panic attack because I hated spreadsheet too. And so I was like, if only this thing is this, and I can just, you know, let it handle all that for me. Um, so that was, I would definitely use Warren. That's answering. Given where you said you were in the project, I would have the impression that you would actually be using it now to manage your, the project itself, to bootstrap. And I'm, I'm just curious, are you doing that? No, I'm not doing that right now. Yeah. Um, it's not is not ready for the whole workflow right now, but we're testing with people, and part of it is using me and somebody else who are um, acting as human agents in the back end to really figuring out, like you said, like how do you customize the design for their workflow. So if I use it, it would be me asking a question and me <laughs> answering, yeah. Um, and then the second question was? Monetization. Oh, <laughs> um, I think that's a really good question. Um, yeah, so I guess that would be what um, I'll figure out in bot camp. <laughs> it's 10 weeks. So um, hopefully by the end, I'll have an answer to that question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Lastly, but not least, we have University of Southern California with Buddy, best unique device dedicated to you. All right, hey everyone. Thank you for being here today to hear about the Buddy Corporation's latest conversational user interface. Now, Buddy, or Best Unique Device Dedicated to You, is a personal, wearable, conversational user interface that's designed to help users with things like goal achievement and habit building. Now, the demand for productivity apps is already very high, and people are using everything from virtual counselors to online personal trainers. And what makes Buddy distinct is that with Buddy, we have found a way to eliminate conflicting advice and eliminate the time it takes to manage the, the, those disparate systems and coordinate everything into one system that operates across a user's devices, aggregating all of those resources, and is supported on the back end by a network of professionals that analyze the data collected by Buddy and continually improve the software. Buddy consists of an ear cuff and operates primarily through cloud computing. Although some processing and data storage does occur on the earcuff itself, the majority takes place on Buddy servers in the cloud. In addition, Buddy is also able to make use of the user's computing devices, such as their computer and phone, for additional processing power. This combination of features ensures that Buddy is consistently able to maintain a snappy response time, and that it can continue to function even when not connected to the internet. 
But he is equipped with a microphone, a heart rate monitor, a camera, a variety of other sensors, and also two sets of speakers, one external and one personal to the user. On the back end, Buddy makes use of a variety of data streams that the user has chosen to integrate, such as email, to keep track of what's happening in the user's life. Buddy also relies on the Buddy network, a network of human experts, such as therapists and physicians, with whom we've worked to ensure that Buddy is always able to respond to any situation in which the user might find themselves. Buddy uses three sources of information when responding to a situation. The user's preferences, the input streams that the user is given it access to, and the expert knowledge of the Buddy network. Buddy begins by monitoring the streams continuously, looking for a cue that will prompt it to respond. When it notices such a cue, it will begin by generating a set of potential responses to the situation, using the expert knowledge of the Buddy network. Then, it will choose the best response based on the details of the particular situation and on the user's preferences. Afterwards, it will look at the user's feedback and use that to update its understanding of the user's preferences, while also contributing any new knowledge it might have learned to the Buddy network to improve the responses of the system as a whole. The Buddy Network is our network of professionals from various fields. These professionals are responsible for analyzing the data and providing solutions for the various challenges posed by Buddy. Uh, data collected from Buddy's um, interactions with users and their environment is sent to this network anonymously. And to make sure that we have an efficient tool, we interviewed a lot of professionals and it was their input that helped us design a better Buddy. Taylor was one of our very first Buddy users. She was referred by her therapist, who was one of the consulting therapists for Buddy's design. And she integrated with her Buddy incredibly quickly. Now we wanted an opportunity to see Buddy in real life. So, with Taylor's permission, we had a reality TV crew follow her around for about a week to see how it all went. Hi, I'm Taylor, and this is my Buddy. And I've been using Buddy for two months now. Gosh, Buddy, how did we meet? Uh, first of all, you should know I, I work a lot, um, and when I'm overworked, I get scattered, and when I'm scattered, I become anxious. So, Buddy is an inclusive system that's designed for people who are underrepresented by existing technologies. So this includes people like children with learning differences, people on the autism spectrum or struggling with mental health concerns, or elderly people with dementia. Now, by designing to include all of these unique abilities and needs, we've been able to create a product that, is, that can better serve everyone. So Buddy is an adaptive system, and this means that it learns both through its interactions with the Buddy network via the updates from the network, as well as from each successive interaction with the user. So from there, it's able to create personalized feedback for each user, and this allows the users to access a variety of resources, such as therapists, life coaches, financial planners, all in one inclusive system that operates across the user's devices. Almost 80 beats per minute. First dates are all about what's going to happen next. Take a breath. Last night you said you just wanted to meet Alex and take it from there. You can't control others, only how you react to them. So, react. 70 beats per minute. Much better. Good. And keep the heart rate low. Keep it casual. No need for a handshake. Hey. <laughs> In this example, so Buddy does all of this using natural language processing. As you can see in the video, Buddy is continually communicating verbally with the user. So first, when it gets input from a user, it gener generates responses based on the general context. And this creates responses that could apply to a variety of situations. It then filters those responses using any keywords or anomalies, and then defines that further by user preferences. This includes things like a user's goals, interests, habits, or existing knowledge level, and then filters by the user's current situation, like work or social context, or a need for tact, and then adds any privacy concerns before responding. In the example we just saw of a single self-activating interaction with Buddy, Buddy was initially activated by an increase that it detected in Taylor's heart rate. It knew from the camera that she was not engaged in any kind of strenuous physical activity, which might otherwise prompt a heart rate increase. And it also knew from its past interactions with her that Taylor had a history of anxiety. Combining this with the knowledge from her calendar that Taylor was on a date tonight, Buddy correctly concluded that Taylor was nervous about her upcoming date and had to be calmed down. Buddy generated a set of potential responses to the situation and chose the best one, a verbal intervention, which had worked with Taylor in the past. Afterwards, when Taylor's heart rate did indeed decrease, Buddy concluded that the intervention had been a success and deactivated itself until the next time it was needed. 
A client may be stressed because of a project at work. So Buddy can respond not just with stress reduction techniques, but with suggestions to solve the problems in the project. Fraser just underwent renovations as well. Take a look. Oh, wow. These are amazing. OK, let's definitely include some of these pictures in the presentation. Um, Buddy, can you skeleton an availability email to those people? Certainly, the emails have been drafted. I've also included a draft to be sent to one of the board members of the Space Museum. It's a frequent support of the client's philanthropy efforts and may be willing to offer a discount. You are good. OK, I'm going to look these over and send them out. In a video, we saw Buddy talking to Taylor through her earpiece. Actually, I have mine on as well, but it's a bit more extravagant than Taylor's. Um, so Buddy was talking to Taylor through her earpiece and using her computer to show her pictures. Taylor has chosen an engagement level of four, which means that Buddy out, um, automatically activates itself whenever it's needed in a situation. And Buddy interacts with Taylor, Taylor bo both visually and verbally. So while uh, suggesting her a venue for her event, it's always showing her visual information on her computer. All right, so we've seen that Buddy works very well as a proactive system. It can offer assistance to users without them even having to ask for it. But in the second part of this video, we also see that Buddy can take verbal direction. So when Taylor asks Buddy to send emails for her, Buddy has the, situa the situational awareness through email access to know both who Taylor's referring to when she says those people and the appropriate way to format a professional email. Now, Buddy also has Buddy Network input, and Buddy, the Buddy Network has built financial management tools into Buddy's responses. This is how Buddy is always searching for a more cost-effective way to do things, so Buddy automatically finds a board member who might be willing to offer a discount. Buddy also has privacy settings, so he knows that Taylor likes to review all emails before they're sent, and he automatically saves the emails as drafts for Taylor's approval. Buddy also knows Taylor's user settings, so Buddy is aware that Taylor likes verbal updates. And using the camera and microphone, Buddy can time those verbal updates of what Buddy's doing to fit in the conversation naturally. So we've seen here that Buddy can work to de-escalate a stressful situation using self-activated intervention. It can proactively research users' current product projects to help assist users, and it can take verbal direction in a specific situational context. So going forward, we're looking to expand the Buddy market, and we're hoping to launch publicly within the next few months. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much. Um, it's all so easy. <laughs> I actually really like the sort of tongue-in-cheek videos of, of you know, sales assistants and associates and directors and research associates at your imagined company. Um, and um, what you've given us is a sort of snapshot of, you know, the perfect agent of several years from now. And um, I, it's, it's fun to see um, how interesting it is to just explore um, thinking through what that will be like and the pitfalls and challenges of what experiences will be like when they're when we have this sort of full-time life coach trusted advisor personal assistant blended into one you know magical thing um, and you know there's a thousand computer science challenges and human engineering challenges to figure out there before we're at that but it's fun to see it's too fun to see it as if it's alive today, right? And that's the, the the step you took creatively is sort of, yes, you know that, but you're going to present it, you know, straight faced as if it's completely existing today. And uh, and 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 I actually kind of like that sort of humorous t twist on it. Um, the um, I do think the the idea that there's a company that owns all this information about me <laughs> is actually like a frightening cons concept and that the, the most perhaps the most interesting question it raises is who will own all of this amazing data about me right and uh, who has access to that and and uh, the idea that it's this buddy corporation and they're sort of malevolent uh, is is a little bit like um, perhaps very deliberate on your behalf um, but it it's sort of an interesting bigger question right um, Anyway, Ready? I was going to say, um, hi. Um, yes, you, it was incredibly ambitious, um, which which I commend. But like a lot of the other projects, I like I fantasized about 
a small piece of it, which I'll just share, um, hopefully it'll be constructive. Um, the idea that, um, and I was reading something about this recently, about um, it, it, like the, the idea that it would, it could be a um, like an anti-anxiety solution that doesn't require a pill. Um, the idea that you could like detect anxiety somehow um, and know that someone you know know the right moment, um, which you express as sort of a challenge. Just it's not just heart rate because they could be exercising whatever. So you find that moment of anxiety and talk the person down. Like if you could do that, again, without a um, serotonin inhibitor, whatever, <laughs> those Lexapro or, well, you know, those anti-anxiety medications, that, that just to find a non-medical, you know, and, and purely sort of talk therapy solution to something like that would be quite amazing. So that was what I fantasized, like a small piece of what I fantasized about what you created. And generally, um, it seems like, on the one hand, you know, I think for all these projects, a great exercise to sort of think large. I mean, and and I could see how useful it was to sort of imagine step by step what Buddy was doing. On the other hand, there's such value in sort of going into one small focused effort. Uh, and I think, you know, for in school, it's, it's probably great to have sort of both the range of experiences. But again, I just shared my fantasy of one <laughs> small piece of that. Well done. Anyone else? So this will take it down to a, a, a low level. Even shooting videos like that and going through the s scenarios is really interesting. Um, for example, you notice some things about the design. Um, if the camera's in the ear cuff, um, it doesn't see anything because the woman's hair is covering the camera. You know. Actually, the camera is here, so. Yeah. But it's not. There's also a barrette attachment for Buddy, so yeah, yeah. if you like to wear your hair down, but, don't fear. You can no, that's right, up. but th th the point is that they provoke a conversation about design and design parameters, and, and that, in fact, even if it's about something future, by this fact it is this thing out there, the conversations you have around it aren't bound by the investments because you're all trying to make this project uh, real, but everything you learn from that conversation can inform the designs you are making that are real. And I think that's the part where the value gets teased out. And, and, uh, and so it's, it's provocative again, and it, that, that forces us to think critically. And that's really helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So that is our last school of this year's Design Expo. We saw nine schools. Here are, again, the name of the schools. We would like to, and highlighted are the name of all the professors which were uh, with the schools throughout the, the course. Can the professors please stand, the ones in the audience? And big thank you to the professors. And also the liaisons are also now highlighted. The liaisons and the professors are partnering up and giving great feedback to the schools so they could select the best project to be here. Can the liaisons in the audience please stand? And thank you, professors and liaisons. And big thanks to the Design Expo organizing team. I organized it last year, and it's a ton of work. And I have a big appreciation for people who organize a conference like this. It's always very inspiring. We hope you're all inspired by what you saw today. And there's a lot more research. Uh, and you can access the website. It's on the Microsoft Research website. And you can also access all the previous years back to, not back to the very beginning, but the last like six years. They're all up there. Thank you very much. Sorry we went over time a little bit. Thank you, judges. Thank you, audience. And see you next year. <laughs>